So let's now consider some of the aspects related with the actual implementation of the simplex method. You'll see that your um, your homework three, if I'm not mistaken, is going to involve uh, working with an implementation of the simplex method. So you get uh, a chance of of having a, a practical experience with the aspects we're going to discuss now. Um, so basically, the, one of the main key things that change uh, in between simplex method implementations that you see in different solvers that are available out there um, associated with how things are selected. And basically, there is two big options when it comes for the, to the simplex method and what you're choosing. Uh, the main one, I would say, is related with how you select the variable entering the basis. So basically, we'll be saying that pick any that has a negative reduced cost, but you will see that quite often you have several variables that show uh, um, a component of the reduced cost vector being negative. So how do you choose them? Um, and that, that can influence quite significantly the performance of your simplex method. And also, it might be so that uh, sometimes when you're trying to select the variable to leave the basis, it might be so that you have some ties. So the, the minimum uh, is such, the theta value is the same for more than one variable, and that becomes more likely as you have many, many more variables. So you have to make a decision on who, which of these variables you're going to select to leave the basis. So... Um, these rules that are for choosing um, which variables go into inside and outside the basis are sometimes they are often referred to what we call pivot rules, uh, pivoting rules, um, and this part specifically is what is known as the pricing uh, phase of the simplex method, which is basically getting that uh, that variable with the most attractive reduced cost, for example. So here are some examples of variable selection rules that are quite common. So the first one that uh, is sort of naive is something called the greedy selection. It's how originally uh, Densing proposed the simplex method. is just looking at your uh, reduced costs and just pick that that in module is largest. is the most negative variable. I say that in introduction to optimization as well. So basically is that variable that is going to have the it has a negative reduced cost with the highest module because that is giving you, in a greed sense, the greatest potential for improvement. Of course, it really depends on the value of theta, but just you know, naively saying, if you just had that information, then picking the largest module is is somewhat reasonable. But this is prone to cycling. Uh, this is this is known to to very often leads to cycling situations. Another idea that tries to fix that is something that is called the bland rule. And the bland rule is, is simply uh, if you have multiple reduced costs that are negative, pick that one with the smallest cardinality index. So you have C1 and C2 both negative, pick C1 regardless of their value. And that is created in a way um, to prevent cycling. Uh, and then it's it's not it's not hard to to convince yourself um, that if you always do that, you you might you're gonna be making choices that that prevent the cycling of the variables. Um, and of course, because it's it's using some sort of arbitrary rule, it, it tends to be inefficient. Um, there is something that is called the lexicographical rule, which is kind of a combination of two th the two things. I only often see them only in textbooks, but they are not really helpful in any sense because they are just a bit more complicated without giving you any sort of benefit in terms of implementation. So there is also a reference for them in textbook. You basically create uh, an, an ordering uh, for the columns and, and use that to pick that that is lowest in the ordering rank. Um, but yeah, there is something about that in the textbook if you're interested, but... It's not really that relevant in a practical setting. Um, and then those that are certainly more relevant, because those are you what you would see in in professional implementation of the simplex method, is something that is called reduced cost pricing, which is basically instead of only looking at the reduced cost, you actually go a step forward calculate what would be the step size you'll be taking in that direction and see what is the total benefit um, in your objective function 
and then you pick that that does the best. But there is a problem with that is to calculate this, you kind of there is a lot of calculation involved. So it's almost like doing all possible steps and take off the simplex method from that vertex you want and then picking the best. And of course, this is very expensive computationally. Um, so one idea is that you, some implementations of this, what they do is instead of using all non-basic variables, just use some. And I don't know, can pick them randomly or can use as a reference somehow to know which basic non-basic variables you will be testing and from those pick the best, like a subset of all possible sub um, non-basic variables. So uh, this is something that is quite often used. And uh, perhaps the most uh, most common I see are these two, which um, their original implementations were proposed in these um, uh, papers there. Um, so basically, DevX is an approximation of steepest edge uh, method. Uh, and the reason for that is that because originally steepest, steepest edge as proposed was really uh, computational intensive. So DevX was a way to calculate it in an approxim approximated setting. But then later in, in the 90s, uh, these two people showed that you can have an efficient implementation of the steepest uh, descent method. And then it turns out that still both of them are uh, used because there is not, there is not a, an absolute winner between DivX and steepest edge, which, which is best in terms of variable selection. And basically what, what steepest edge is, is, show, is trying to do, it looks at the, the direction vector so, so it looks at the directional vector D and it compares it against the vector C and try to find those, those directions that form the highest possible angle theta between them. And the direction with largest angle with the vector C is what is the, called the steepest direction. So you try to move it against the vector C as efficiently as possible in terms of being, you know, optimally, that would be the direction of maximal descent. So you're picking the, the direction D that is closest to that. So that involves calculating D directions, including basic directions for several times. And that can be quite computation expensive unless you, you have appropriate computational structures to save in calculations. So here are the papers in case you're interested in and seeing how these things are done in a more sort of protection professional setting. But for our course, we will concentrate on looking into these two because they are much simpler to implement. Um, so another important thing uh, related to the implementation of the simplex method is that um, it's associated with this matrix uh, inverse B times AJ, uh, which um, which you, you have to recalculate over and over every time you renew your basis, right? Uh, because once you have this term, then you calculate your reduced cost, then you calculate your directions D, and you can calculate your tethers. So, um, so if you think about that in a sort of naive setting, you know, without actually worrying about computational aspects, what you could do is um, um, you can, you know, just recalculate this every iteration. And, and that's going to cost a fortune computationally. So, so basically what we see is that the revised simplex method is just a way to try to, to some extent, make the calculations associated with that minimal uh, in, in a computational sense, and both in terms of number of, of, of uh, operations done, but also in terms of storage. Um, so... Let's just think for a second how we would implement what we just seen. Um, so we have the matrix B, and then we calculate this vector. I'm calling it P uh, just because you will see that every so often when we presenting the simplex method, we tend to attribute variable names to things that involve the inverses because you would be using, it's an indication that you're using like a backslash operator. So you're doing the, a backslash operator to calculate P by solving this system. Um, and then what you do is, uh, by the way, these P's are called the simplex multipliers. So then what you can do is use this P to calculate the reduced costs. So you solve one linear system. And then later on, when you have to select, you select your column J, and then what you go is that you go and solve this system, 
to then calculate this new variable u, which is also you know, the solution of a linear system to give you this term, which is the, the negative of the d. Like we saw this in the simplex method um, uh, pseudocode in the last video. So you see I'm solving one system here and I'm solving one system here. And one important thing is that these two systems have this matrix, the inverse of B in common. So, so if um, what this revised simplex method is, is trying to do is figure out ways that instead of having to solve two separate systems, actually keep the same common element uh, distributed and, and prevent having to calculate it twice. So the key for that is, is making the, ver the matrix B inverse B to be available at the beginning of each iteration. Because once that B inverse of B is, is available for you at the beginning of the iteration, then you can calculate your P and you calculate your U just by simple, you know, operations. This is a, this is a vector times that matrix and this is a vector times that matrix. So it's, it's much cheaper than actually solving two linear systems that will call procedures for matrix decomposition and so on and so forth. Um, but for that to work, we have to be able to, to update this inverse of B for every iteration. So we have the inverse of B at this iteration, then at the next iteration, iteration we want to have the inverse of B bar, and then so on and so forth, right? Let's see how we can do that. So the trick comes from the fact that, you know, once again, realizing that B and B bar, they are adjacent matrices, adjacent bases. And because they are adjacent bases, they are deferring only on this column here, okay? So um, that means that in order to update this into this, it's going to be done in a way that we retain the validity of a given relationship, of an equality condition. And by doing so, um, in order to retain the validity of that, we're going to rely on the notion of elementary row operations, EROs. So elementary row operations are those operations that you can do with your matrix in which you're not you're not fun, you're not changing fundamental aspects associated with that matrix, uh, fundamental properties associated with that matrix, and uh, and there's basically one type of elementary row operation um, is you get a row, you multiply by a by a um, constant, and then you add it to another row. Um, and and that's about it. So you get a you get a row, you multiply by a constant, and then you add it that multiplied value new row to another row. Um, because by doing so, it's known that you're not you're not changing things like the determinant of the matrix and so on. So when you, the reason why we're interested in that is well, first of all, because they're much cheaper than than go about inverting matrices. Right, and secondly, they have really important properties when it comes to the computational aspects of of implementing the the simplex method. So, um, first of all, notice that whenever we're doing EROs on a matrix B, this is can be equivalent defined as as um, looking at the matrix a matrix Q, which is nothing more than an identity matrix plus this matrix D, not Dij, D, that pre-multiplies B, and D matri the D matrix itself, which is trying to represent the, the elementary row operation, is formed like so. It has all components zero, with exception of one component Ij, and that component Ij has the value beta that you want to multiply the jth row and add to then get that row added to the ith row. So that means that I'm going to get that row j multiplied by beta and add to the row i. So here is a, is a numerical example to kind of make it clear. So Suppose I have originally this matrix B, one, two, three, four, five, six, and I'm looking at this matrix Q that is representing elementary row operations on the matrix B. 
what this matrix Q is telling me, while well, this matrix Q is the sum of identity plus a D matrix, and it's telling me that you can see that the D matrix that got added here is that one that has the element um, three, one, uh, sorry, one, one, three, um, different than zero, and it is two. So basically, because D one, three is two, what this is telling me is that I'm getting row three, I am multiplying by two, and I'm adding it to row one. And that's exactly what happens if I get the matrix Q and pre-multiply B. I get this matrix here, which is getting this row three, multiplying by two, so I get 10 and 12. And then when I add 10 with one, I get 11, and 12 with two, I get 40. So this is a way to represent the elemental row, the elementary row operations with this matrix Q. And of course, if I keep doing elementary row operations over and over and over again, I can just keep pre-multiplying B by a sequence of uh, Q matrices. So some, some obvious things about Q, that Q is going to be invertible, which is gray. And it also, because my sequence of elementary row operations can be represented by a collection of multiplications of these matrices, I can even have a very efficient way to, to you know, store those and, and keep track of what I'm doing. Um, so yeah, so we're going to use that and thinking about our matrix. So remember that our objective is to have available B, the inverse of B bar at the beginning of the R iteration. So recall that B minus 1B, if I multiply these two matrix, I get the, I recovered the identity matrix again. And remember that whenever I do B minus 1, and the column of A associated with that B matrix, that, that basic variable BI, I obtain the, the ith unit vector, again, the vector of zeros with one at the position I. So if you think about what I'm doing when I multiply B minus one B bar, basically what I'm getting is for all the other columns where these two things match, I'm getting the the uh, um, unit vector EI, with exception of the column U, which is going to be represented by a B minus 1 AJ, which is that non-basic variable that became basic, and it's going to appear here as U. So I'm going to have like 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, and so on, and then the, the U right there, all right? Um, so if I want to, so what I can do with this is if I am able to perform, so I get this, this thing, right? So, but if I'm able to perform elementary row operations in a way that I can convert that back to identity, it would mean that I would be back with this term, this term being equivalent of my inverse of my new basis B bar. So what I can do is find this Q matrix that pre-multiplies Q beat Q, uh, the inverse of B, such that this becomes um, B bar minus one. Or in other terms, what I'm trying to find is what is the elementary row operations such that when this happens, I get the identity matrix. Because once that is the case, this term becomes this, which is exactly the matrix I'm looking for. So to put simply, um, we just have to define a Q such that when this becomes an identity, then when this becomes an identity matrix, I can automatically recover B minus one, uh, B bar minus one, or the inverse of B bar. So what I can do then is, if this Q matrix can actually be pre predefined just by looking at this, because what I want to do is to turn this into one and all the rest into zero. So, the way to turn this into one is basically multiply this 
multiply this row by um, um, 1 over ul, and that makes this term become 1. And then for all the other rows, what I do is I multiply this element by minus ui times um, U, ui by ul and add it to the i row. So, so that would mean that when I add it to this term, I'll get a, a I'll get a zero. Um, for ex so for example, because when I get this row, and I multiply by minus u y over u l, I get this u l cancels out with that. I get a minus u y. And then when I add to the UI that is here, it becomes zero. So that's a way, it's sort of an automated way in which I can zero these terms. And when I do so, so once I apply all these operations and this, um, so I apply the element, the, the elementary row operations to convert this into the identity matrix, this is the same as finding the matrix Q I would be multiplying here. And therefore, what I'm left with is the inverse. If I apply the same, uh, it, it would be akin to applying the same uh, elementary row operations to be uh, the inverse of B. And that means that I'm getting the inverse of B bar. And that's, that's what leads us to the revised simplex method, the method in which I don't really have to solve any systems. So what I have to do is I start with my basis B, I calculate once an inverse, and from now on, I calculate P by being a product of a vector and a matrix, I calculate C with a product of a vector and a matrix plus an addition, um, and then this is exactly the same as before, this is exactly the same as before, these are all the same as before, and so are these. So now the difference is, I get my matrix B minus one, and I, I put it at jointly, I concatenate it with this vector U, um, which is B minus one A, J, here. And then I will perform uh, ERO's to convert this into the uh, unit vector L, EL. Because when I do so, I am performing um, elementary row operations, ERO's, that will convert B minus one into B bar minus one. So I just am doing simple additions and multiplications to forgive from this inverse to get to this inverse. Then I update my bases accordingly. I update my current B minus one matrix and recalculate my vector P, my vector C bar of reduced costs, and reiterate. So no systems need to be solved. You're just doing simply a simple additions, addition and multiplication instead. Um, so some, some remarks about the revised simplex method. If you wanna go even further and you don't wanna have to calculate um, some elements outside, like uh, you can you can even automate the calculation or the update of the the vectors of with the reduced cost and the vectors with the uh, the current value of the objective function. You just co you concatenate them them on top of the this matrix that you apply in the elementary row operations. And if you apply the same elementary row operations, what you will see is that C B B minus one becomes C B um, a bar b bar minus one. So uh, you can you can save even further by having that at the top of your of this matrix here. Uh, and that's why the simplex method is is more efficient in terms of memory uh, because you're not saving the whole space of matrices. You don't have b minus one aj's. Well, b minus one aj. Uh, is a is a vector, but you have you know, you know the CBB minus one or all the other matrices in in between because you're just keeping track of a single uh, small scalar matrix. You're only keeping track of the columns you need as you go. Um, and 
some some ideas in terms of efficient implementations of the um, of uh, the simplex method, revised simplex method, is that even though because you know when you actually look at the computations of this, whenever you 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 are doing your elementary row operations instead of actually reinverting the matrix, um, you you might be including a some degree of numerical error. So after you do that after a few iterations, you might end up with a matrix that doesn't look like the inverse of B bar at all anymore because of all the error that has been accumulated with the arrows. So every so often, it might make be a good idea to restart from scratch and actually recalculate the, the matrix, the inverse, or, or recalculate the systems um, of equations every so often. So that's called reinversion. Um, there is also something in terms of representation. Clearly, these matrix Qs can be represented by sparse matrices. Most of the elements, other than in the diagonal and what you're doing with your um, elementary row operations, are uh, all, all the other elements are zero. So, so that's a, these matrix Qs are very sparse. Um, so, one idea is that instead of having, you can keep track of the same matrix that is sparse by just adding the elements uh, little by little. And that means that you, um, instead of just keep updating B1, you can just keep track of what you're doing in this matrix. And while B1 is a matrix that is not sparse at all, this is highly sparse, so that's what you keep from one iteration to the next. Um, and then there is a trade-off on how much you're keeping and how much you're recalculating, but it might make sense whether if you have matrices B that are really large. Um, and um, last but not least, so it, this is a key important. Uh, this is important in in this in the sense or in the actual implementation of the simplex method. It relates with the fact that um, you might be interested in use decomposition versions of this inverse to save in in, in storage or to improve the efficiency in terms of inversion. That comes from the use of of the backslash operator, for example, like we said before. Um, so another, another interesting aspect related with the simplex is the, the way it's often presented. We're not going to explore tableau representation too much, but it does pop up here and there when we have to explain a concept that uses information from the simplex method, like when we're talking about dual simplex or when we're talking about, uh, I don't know, cut generation in, in integer programming. Um, sometimes it's helpful to have this sort of tableau table the representation of, of a current basis uh, in, in the simplex method, and you can do that by using this Tableau representation. And the Tableau representation is nothing more than the less efficient information-wise uh, way of, of keeping track of what's going on in the method. So basically what you do is you have a whole representation of the B minus one A and B minus one B simultaneously. So basically you have a collection of rows where these coefficients on the left are representing the components of each of those. So for those basic, basic variables, we just seen that these are the the E, uh, the I uh, unit vector. And for the others, uh, you know, you actually only leave interesting values for the non-basic variables for that basis. And that you have the solution of the system on the right-hand side. And you also have a, you can add, like we did with the revised simplex method, we, we can have a bit here that is representing this bar, because if you perform the same uh, um, uh, EROs, you convert this into uh, the inverse of B bar, so you get the reduced costs there for free as well. And you can also have this term uh, sitting here, so you can get the the value of your um, uh, the value of your objective function at a given basis. And also, if you update this, uh, you will have them accordingly. There is just a question of uh, a reason of sign that is because of the way uh, things are laid out. Is just to make sure you you know you you are adding things with the right signs. Is that it's related with that change of sign in all between the vector u and the actual direction d. So you have to be careful. There is a there is a sign change that makes this show negative values instead. Um, and then the tableau kind of looks like this. Uh, that's just a tableau representation, which is is like in, in two lines here. But actually, you and you have a line for each basic variable with the value of the basic variable being displayed there, 
the value of the objective function display there, and then the reduced costs display here. We'll do some numerical examples in the exercise session so you get familiar with that. If you did introduction to optimization, you have seen this more than enough already. Um, but this sometimes is a useful form for when we explain concepts in the future, so we're going to practice uh, a bit more later on. But but it's it's not efficient at all. It's it's the main reason why we talk about um, Tableau representation. It, it's because, well, in the past it was relevant because you didn't have computers to help you learn these things, so you had to do a lot of this by hand, so it is helpful in that sense. Um, and it also has this as perspective that it kind of simplifies uh, the representation of, of the all the elements associated with a given basic matrix B. Yeah, so some nomenclature for, for this tableau is that whenever you pick the column uh, B minus one AJ, this is the it's called the pivot column, is the column that you're gonna make it look like the ith uh, unit vector. And the alpha row is the basic variable you just decided that it is going to leave the basis. Um, so you call that the pivot row, and the intersection of the pivot row and the pivot column is the pivot element, which is the element in the u vector that you turn into one with um, your elementary row operations. Okay. Um, like I was saying, the, all the information available is uh, explicitly available. Uh, in the Tableau, which is useful for hand calculations, and that's all. And um, likewise, when you perform EROs, what you're basically doing with the Tableau is converting them, the Tableau from this form into this form, and then once again, changing the the matrix B, uh, the ba matri basic matrix B into, into B bar, but only in terms of its inverse. And likewise, it converts this term updating this element and converts this term updating this element accordingly. So you can you can solve the simplex method just by doing elementary row operations, which is exactly what the reduced simplex does anyways. You don't have to solve any systems in that. The last aspect associated with the simplex method um, implementation is is the notion of how you generate these initial feasible solutions. So all the pseudocodes we showed so far, they have this thing at the first row saying that you start from a basic feasible solution. And how you get that? Well, whenever you have a problem that is well-behaved, written like so, what happens is, um, let's, let's make these two variables into constraints. So you have a1x1 plus a12x2 less or equal than B1, and you have A21X1 plus A22X2, less or equal than B2. And that has two variables and two constraints. So what we can do is we move this to the side and we add here a slack constraint for this, a slack constraint for that. Uh, then we have that these two slack constraints that behave like the normal variables. And then what we do is we trade this out and convert into equality, right? Um, and this, by doing so, we have an obvious basis to start with. So if we say that IB, um, because we're grown-ups, what we're actually going to do is that I'm going to call this X3, I'm going to call this X4, because they are just variables like the others. So I can make my, my basic variables be x3 and x4 and that forms me the system my matrix b is the identity 1100 zero, zero, like so and that means that x3 equals x4 which is equal to b1 b2 and x1 and x2 is zero and that is the same as saying that for this problem, what I'm doing is I'm making the origin my first basic feasible solution. And once I make the origin my basic feasible solution, the algorithm can carry on and, and do what it does. The problem is when you have greater or equal than constraints or when you have equality constraints, the likelihood is that these are one of those affine subspaces. They are defined affine subspaces that are shift from the origin. And because they are shifted from the origin, most likely means that the origin trying to do this won't work. 
because zero zero, the origin won't be a basic feasible solution. So when that is the case, what we have to do instead is to rely on the use of artificial variables. So basically what these artificial variables will do is they will take the role of assuming value whenever the constraint is infeasible. So instead of absorbing slack, you know, excess of feasibility, what they absorb is infeasibility. Um, and that leads us to defining a subproblem that looks like so. So um, suppose we have, in that same example, we had A11x1 plus A12x2, but that was now greater or equal than B1. And that one here, A21x1 plus A22x2, now is less or equal than B12. Okay, so when I do the same trick with these two uh, variables here, what happens is I will have to actually have a minus x3 for this variable to represent this likeness. And for this one, I can have plus x4 and then become equals, that become equals. But now what happens is I get my B matrix becomes this B minus one, zero, zero, one. And that means that x3 is minus b1 and b2. And you can see that if this is positive, then this is not feasible. So that you don't have a feasible starting basis. So what we do, we move that along a little bit more and like so, and add a variable that would allow us a trick. So I'll call it x5 because we are all grown ups. And instead of choosing B to have X3 and X4, what I actually do is make this B X4 and X5. So this matrix here can be changed into one zero and then X5 becomes B1. So that, that's just it. And that gives me a starting basis artificial, but starting basis to start my method. And what do I do with those? Well, I change my problem, my actual optimization problem into something that we call an auxiliary problem in which what I'm trying to do is to find a basis for this in which all my artificial variables, which in here on purpose so we can see where they are, I'm calling them Y, are zero. Because if I found a solution where all my artificial variables are zero, that means that I found a solution in which all my artificial variables are non-basic. So I have a basis only formed with my original variables. And that basis is, ba is a basic feasible solution for my original problem before I change the objective function. Which is then, what I can do then is stop the algorithm right there, get that basis, and use as a starting point from the normal simplex. So my normal simplex method, instead of starting from the origin, we start from that basis that I found with this auxiliary problem. Um, and that's exactly what is represented by this problem here. And if it happens that you can't find, when you find the optimal of this auxiliary problem is such that, you know, your y's are not all zeros, it means that even when I try to minimize infeasibility, my minimum infeasibility solution is a solution that has infeasibility, so it's not feasible. Unless my minimal infeasibility solution is a solution with zero feas infeasibility, uh, I can't proceed, and that means that my problem is, is infeasible from the get-go. When you do solve your auxiliary problem and finally find a solution where your ox artificial variables are all zero, there's basically two things that can occur. So the good case scenario is if you realize that your basis that you just found is only composed by the columns of your original matrix A, so there is none of these columns associated with the artificial variables Y, that means that B is can directly used as an initial basis for your problem. So you can use that and call the simplex method in, in the original problem with this as an initial basis. So that's all good. But sometimes, um, it might be so that the auxiliary problem, and as often the case, is highly non-degenerate. 
and that means that uh, highly degenerate. So that means that your optimal basis might be so that some of the basic variables are actually artificial variables with zero value. And that's an issue because then you don't have a basis to actually immediately give to your, um, to your problem. So if that is the case, then we're gonna have to do some pre-processing. And here are some aspects that we can have in mind when we're thinking about this pre-processing. The, the first of them comes from that theorem we saw in lecture two, saying that if we have a matrix that has a rank M and you only have K, which is smaller than M uh, linearly independent columns, you can go and pick additional uh, columns from A and form a, a basis B. You can find extra linearly independent columns to form your basis. So that's why we proved that theorem then. You can, we can do this process, uh, this pre-processing that will pick additional columns from A to form a basis. Um, and how we do that? Well, we look at, look at this ELF artificial basic variable YL0. So this is a basic variable that I want to make non-basic. And what I do is I look at my matrix A and try to find a component J with an element in the ELF row that is non-zero. Because the fact that this element is non-zero indicates to me that this AJ column is gonna be linearly independent with all my other elements. And what I can do then, uh, can I, what I can do then is to use my ERO's to make that selected J variable, non-basic variable, basic. And I can repeat that M minus K times until I have a basis that is only formed by the columns of the original matrix A. Um, that is a solution, of course, but even that might not necessarily work. Let's have a look. Um, so this is just showing that when you pick that AJ column, it is definitely linearly independent. This is it's exactly the same argument of the theorem we proved in the, I think in the previous video, where we show that because this element is the only, when you pick this column of inverse BAJ that is there's a elf entry that is non-zero. All the other all the other elements in the Bayer minus one a will have zero component for that. So it means that this vector has to be linearly independent. It's exactly the same argument as we had before. The issue I think is a bit more complicated is when you can't find a non-zero element. So when you 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 identify yeah. So this is my basic variable I want to get rid of. Uh, so this is my elf. Uh, variable and basic variable. And then when I look at my non-basic variables, I can't find one that has a non-zero, all the components are zero. Um, well, that has a reason. It's, it can only happen if it's the following. So let let G be this row of B minus one that you looking for an element that is different than zero. That you won't be able to find an element that is different than zero if that g is a is a null vector, okay. Um, but if g is a null vector, g being that row of b minus one, or if b minus one has a null row, what it basically is telling you is that you know get the null vector and multiply that, you're gonna get zero, and that is the same as you multiply that. And we know that because this equals to that, this relationship also holds. So basically that means that we have this going on. And that row is just being a redundant row sitting in your B minus one matrix. Of course it is, it's a, it's a row with all zeros, right? So that means that from the get go, what you actually had was a, was a uh, redundant constraint for your problem. So you can just simply get rid of it. The solution is if you, it happens that you actually found, um, you actually found you in the situation where you can't find a AJ uh, with a non-zero component, then, then it means that that row can be completely removed altogether. And that means that the artificial variable is just being removed from the problem. So 
no no harm. It just can be killed off the basis. So basically, if if you look to summarize, um, if you have basic artificial variables, you try to remove them. Um, if you have, if you can find a non-basic variable to replace with a non-zero component in the alpha row of that basic variable, fantastic. Do ERO's and remove it. If you can't find all your non-basic variables actually have zero component, you know this is just a redundant constraint on the artificial variables. You can just remove the artificial variable from the get-go. And just you know, just to summarize, this first phase of finding basic feasible solutions is what it's called phase one. And uh, the second phase in which, uh, the following phase in which you give the basis you just found to the normal simplex with the, without the artificial variables in the original objective function is what we call phase two. And surprisingly enough, this is what is called the two-phase simplex method. And actually is the standard form of the simplex method, you, the, the vision that you're actually gonna be implementing uh, when you work with that. So we'll stop here and then in the next video, we'll look into this some geometric insights of the simplex method um, to give an idea why is it so that it actually converges much faster than you, one would expect. So see you then.